We all know what the roguelite life is like. It's a constant cycle of failing and getting back up quite like... Uh, quite like Galen's internet, apparently. Yeah, that that's, that's fair. Uh, I think we should finish the intro for him while he reconnects. Yep. Yep. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Music Arcade! Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very jankerific episode of Music Arcade. I'm Galen the Sound Guy Firestone. I am um, Rana Kill. And I am Eddie, and I am somehow more alive than Galen's internet. Yeah, I, I mean, that that's not a high bar. So, hello, everyone, from this very crappy hotel in Northridge, California, uh, that I'm staying in while I move houses. Um, the internet here is a thing. <laughs> the internet here or is a thing. it isn't, which is the problem, really. Yeah, uh, we are talking disconnects every five minutes or so. Like, that's not even a joke. Every five minutes or so. I am, uh, currently streaming from my phone. So, uh, here's hoping that works. Also, I apologize for not looking at the camera. I have to look at the microphone. So, I'm I'm able to see you guys, but not, like, able, able to see you guys. So, if you have anything to say, I'm sorry. Um, oh, good thing this is mostly an audio-based format, being a podcast. Yes, it is, but I still love our chat and their contributions when we get it. Uh, that said, we are talking about some roguelites today. Uh, a look behind the curtain. This was like our fourth topic that we were trying to pick for the week. Yes, it was. And I prepared all the previous one, by the way. You did, and I thank you. I still have notes. I know, and hopefully we'll actually get to cover some of them, because I noticed your, uh, soon playing segment. So hopefully we'll be able to make use of them. I would like to if we could. Yes. Yeah, because uh, tomorrow is the official start of the Summer Games Fest. There was already some pretty interesting news, and I like to keep my ear to the grapevine. Yes, indeed. Um, and, uh, man, you guys picked some great tracks today. I was listening through this list, and there was only one that I kind of didn't like, and it's one that I posted. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> irony for you right yeah no turns out uh, roguelites a, a genre game with some pretty good bangers apparently so let's go ahead and dive right into one into the breach man the guitar light on this one's fun I like this one yeah uh, so I picked three tracks for this episode, and that was the last track I picked because I realized the other two were maybe not fully expressing what I wanted as my point, because they are a bit offbeat, uh, for reasons I'll explain uh, when it comes to it, so I wanted something a bit more grounded. And uh, tactical 8x8 grids, very predictable battle on top of a small squad of mecha is pretty grounded as a, as far as settings go. And right. that music, along with the rest of the soundtrack, works pretty well to help establish that. Yeah. Um, this one's just got a good vibe to it. It's it, it could fit into a variety of different games, which I guess makes sense because... Roguelite, I don't really think, is a genre in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, part of what uh, I'm basically uh, leading to throughout this uh, uh, episode. One of the main through lines is that given the diversity of the gameplay loops in the genres, uh, music can in uh, focus on... Uh, within the pace of the gameplay, uh, establish the atmosphere, the ambience, the kind of setting the game is uh, going through. Uh, for in this example, it's something that's very deliberate. It's t tactical with a lot of predictability, which is why it has these uh, sharp notes, but these calm tones. Uh, the loop is a part not only of the gameplay but also of the settings since uh, what's happening is that you uh, drop down uh, with a few mechs, kill giant insects, save the world 
and then uh, time warp to another timeline to save that too. Which is... Uh... Other than the time warp part, this was sounding very much like a multiplayer game that we've been playing lately as well. I know, right? <laughs> I was going to say uh... that, uh, alternatively, if you're bad at the game like I am, you die and then you restart the timeline to try and save it this time. Yes. Or to save another one while the timeline you died in is doomed forever. Because I feel I like I played a... Hero. a... I feel like I played a version of this game that I didn't quite like. Hmm. This this sounds very familiar. Uh, it, it was, was made on the by Epic the Game Store a while back. Yeah, and it was made by the guys who made uh, FTL. I guess it wasn't this one. I played a game with a very similar conceit that I didn't really like. It was a turn-based RPG, but it had a very similar like. And a very similar like thing to it. It was it was very much like a go back in time and fix your timeline thing, and very kind of branching. This sounds familiar, is what I'm saying. I see, I see. Uh, but I think what is underlined here is kind of the routine that's gotta be established. Like, sure, the first few times it sounds uh, heroic and bombastic, but after. 70, uh, 80, 100 loops, punching giant insects into buildings uh, starts getting almost like a routine. And I think that track in particular really strike the nice balance between being the think tank and also uh, having the gravitas of the giant mechs and also be having it be another day in the office. <coughs> I love like, how that's another day in the office. Like, I get it, but I love how that's another day in the office. Yeah, exactly. Like, the uh, other game uh, soundtrack this kind of reminded me of, now that I think of it, is uh, Space Chem, which is a puzzle game about assembling molecules. Hmm. That's the level of uh, just observing calmly the situation we're on. Because you have all the time in the world... <laughs> Uh, both in setting, given the time warp thing, and uh, in the fact that it's a turn-by-turn -turn game. That encourages some very deli deliberate observation, action, calculating your next turns. Huh. All right. Or going head in and regretting your decisions, if you're me. Exactly. I find that when it comes to this genre, there's a lot of regret. Yeah. Yep. But hey, some games are more accommodating to charging guns blazing with a giant robot. Tell us a bit about RoboQuest. This this game has a very different vibe from Into the Breach. This is much more fast paced. It uh, sounds like it. Yeah, I've seen some people equate it a little bit to what if Borderlands was a roguelite, and I remember. Uh, a while back, Rana mentioned this this game and how the soundtrack was so good that he was al almost uh, dancing to the soundtrack in game, even though it's not a rhythm game. And in like five minutes, both Gideon and I added the game to our wish list on Steam. Uh, I got to yeah, play it's, this. It's uh, less that I was dancing and more that the pace of the music encouraged me. Uh, to uh, do what the game wanted, which is to be aggressive and do acrobatic bumps and back uh, turns and shooting and staying into the action. And I actually have a bit of a, let's say, hot take. I don't uh -oh. know how hot it is. But uh, this soundtrack gets me going and gets me to be aggressive in game much more than the Doom soundtrack does, even though I adore that soundtrack. Interesting. But it, it's a different kind of energetic. Doom is an oppressive energy because you are in yes. hell. This is much more of a free-flowing kind of energy that, that I get. A, a more go with it. Just just go ahead. Do your thing. Free-flowing, you say, huh? Because I actually have a comment about that. Go on. This song is not free-flowing. In fact, it does the thing that I'm discovering I hate more and more, or at least I'm revealing that I hate more and more. It does the start and stop thing, but it does it very subtly. Every time there's a snare hit, the rest of the song ducks out. 
So it creates this, like, push-pull effect that's just driving my ears insane. Oh yeah, just for a brief moment, never to mention it. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm trained to hear this sort of thing, and whenever someone- back in college, you had a lot of, like, music guys who would do this a lot. I guess this is just an EDM thing? I- I don't know what this particular technique is called. Either that or they put, like, a- either that or they put, like, a noise gate on, like, screw you level or a compressor, or they're doing something with this. But it's just like... Ooh! Ooh, it just bothers me. I hate it when drums do that. It's not the only song on this list that does that, either. <laughs> And it's that start and stop thing. I'm like, please, don't don't duck the rest of the song out to play a drum hit. It's literally every beat. You don't have to do this. Just, just, there's enough room especially, in this for the sound to breathe. Stop. Especially since, uh, as far as the gameplay goes, uh, you have basically large areas full of enemy you gun down, and there is an alternate, much calmer version of the music when you are in a bit of a safe zone between two of those uh, murder holes. Nice. Yeah, the, the mix on the album starts with the, the safer version, uh, the calmer, let's say, version. And then it, mo it moves into the, the more aggressive one, just like it happens in the game. Right. You start in a safe haven, and once you open the doors and go past them, then the, the real energy kicks in. Gotta be honest, kinda, this sounds uh, more like uh, Left 4 Dead than it does, uh, than it does, um, Borderlands right now. I can Left see. Left 4 Dead is a bit, a bit, uh, far more low paced, I'd say. Uh, but it does have a similar vibe of just going through, uh, entering safe zones and mowing down the enemies in front of you. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what I was playing. referring to, yeah. Ah, left for that being slow-paced. I see you're not playing with the same people I'm playing with. Yeah, oh, also God. a factor. I've seen some very interesting multiplayer shenaniganry in that game. I put the fear of fire into my friends. Good. Yep, that, Good. that sounds like you. Sounds like you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it... Galen actually brought up that this sounds a lot like uh, EDM and probably would be classified as EDM, I think. Yeah, it's a straight-up art style. Yeah, I usually despise EDM. I, it's not a genre I enjoy. And yet, this track is on my workout playlist, and it's not the only one in this episode to be featured there. Eddie, yeah. I hate to break it Spoiler. to you, but you are a hard style fan. You're the guy who introduced me to Master Boot Record, remember? I was introduced to Master Boot Record by another person who just had completely different taste in music than I do, so I don't know how the hell this happened. <laughs> Similarly to how I don't know how the hell my favorite album of 2021 was a uh, metalcore album. Mine was a cheesy so, power metal album in retrospect, so I get it. Weird few years for my music taste. That, Boy howdy. That's all I have to say. <laughs> But moving along to something a bit more traditional, I guess, sounding. Traditional is a word for it. Um, generic is another word for it. Friendly is the word that comes to friendly. me. Friendly. It is friendly. It is a friendly, yeah. uh... Playful a little yeah. cute uh, track. So, uh, this is the regular first world stage theme from a game called Peglin, which is roguelike Peggle. Um, yeah. this is fun for a few hours, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, but much like the song itself, the more I play the game, the less I enjoy it. It gets yeah, repetitive think... quick. Yeah, I I've think seen the game... Some uh... other, I've seen some other streamers share a similar opinion. It's really fun at the start, but then the... The uh, concept the... is very nice, very nicely executed, they need to add more to it. Yes. 100% like agree. The simple fact I know they're working on things like uh, different Pegling character classes, yep. which will add some variation right from the start, that will help a lot. I'd love some more stages than just the three we get, that would be nice. Yeah. Because the three worlds we get are just the same three worlds, and they only have the same kind of boards on them. There's... Uh, there's n for a roguelike, really... there's just not enough variety, and honestly... Yeah. That's kind of my opinion of this soundtrack. Like, nothing of this soundtrack tries anything too fancy. It just, 
it plays the song that it needs to play for the area. This one is the forest area. It's very lively, very bouncy, very smiley. It's, 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 it's not that engaging. I'm the guy who picked this song, by the way. Like, this was me. This was my call. And I'm like, I don't regret picking the song. But I'm kind of like meh on the game. I gotta be honest. From what yeah. I, from what I've seen, it is, uh, actually also has very short worlds compared to other games. Like, They're pretty short. Uh, uh, a game that we could compare it more or less to would be Slay the Spire, which also has three worlds as you advance. Yep. The gameplay is vastly different, but oh, yeah. the progression is sort of similar. But the worlds in Slay the Spire are much longer. Yeah. This this game has fairly short worlds, which can lead you to just getting like five event nodes in a row and no mm -hmm. combat. Yep. Although, what I will say is that I like Peglin's music more than Slay the Spires. Oh, so do I. I don't even remember Slay the Spires music, so I have to agree just sort of by That's default. my issue with it. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and I do remember it somehow. Uh, but, uh, yeah, at least they went with something that has, uh, it plays with the setting and the atmosphere with the uh, cute goblin looks to it. Yeah. But within that frame, like, there's a reason why you picked, uh, battle music from another world. I put this one as a temporary, uh stopgap solution when creating the playlist we're using as a point of reference mm -hmm. and you said it worked just as well because yep. the musics are kind of interchangeable they really kind of are like they, they, they fit the area well enough they're just taking like they're not taking any chances this is just friendly rogue light just puzzle game stage dot mp3 it's just yeah, very and... it's very on the nose yes and uh, I'll come by later with some mention of some way to make uh, something that's equally as friendly, but maybe a bit more bold. Yeah. One of the coming tracks. Yeah, I, I, I think I know the track you're talking about, and I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I don't have much to say on this as a result of, like, we spent most of the time talking about the game and not the music. Because there just isn't really that much to say about the music. It's just there. It works, it's fine, there's nothing offensive about it, but it's just there. You win a wood, there are wood instruments. Yep. It kind of, it complements the, the vibe that the game gives off, where it's sort of a, a throwback to SNES-era puzzle games. Sure. Uh, the, soundtrack, the soundtrack isn't 16-bit, but it, it does give me that vibe similar to the, the compositions of games from that puzzle games specifically yeah from that era now yeah. that i think of it just one way they could have uh, say uh, made the music a bit more dynamic there's a critical hit system in this game mm -hmm. where when you uh, ball hits a critical peggle which you get randomly shuffled in the peggle uh, pegs are still there uh, every turn mm -hmm. uh, you enter critical mode which uh, increases the value of your hit. If the music swelled up while you were in critical mode, just that would add a little bit of dynamism to that it. That would add a lot of texture. So, yeah, I, I'm the guy who picked this one, and I'm just thrashing it right now, so... Uh... It's interesting to talk about uh, tracks we like, but also about tracks that could do better. Yeah. Yeah. According to three random chumps on the internet. Essentially, well, yeah. A sound engineer and two random chumps on the internet. Okay, I'd like to think that we're at least informed, especially after 31 episodes of this. I almost okay. cursed. Yeah, a, a, a sound engineer and, and two random, decently informed chumps. On there the you internet. go. <laughs> Perfect. And with that, let's move on to a much better song and also a game that I liked. Take it away, whoever picked this incredible song. Well, guess who picked another song that fits in a workout playlist? Fair. It's me! Yay! So, uh, remember how we had uh, a couple episodes where we showed how much Galen and I enjoy metal? Mm-hmm. Now, this is metal. This is this very is, metal. This is metal. Can confirm. Uh, to those who don't want to be spoiled, this is the theme to the second phase of the final boss of Hades. So I good! I name the boss. 
in case you don't want to be spoiled, but it's so good. It's so good. I remember. I remember uh, when I first mentioned that I added this to my workout playlist, uh, Rana called me insane and then applauded me for being insane. <laughs> yeah, this, this goes fast. This one does not play around. This one is... This one is the kind right. of music that Dragon Force thinks they're making. Fast-paced, heavy-hitting. <laughs> Sorry, I will never stop ragging on that band. Sorry. Um, Worst part, you're, you, you're you know right. you're not sorry. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> um, Don't lie to our viewers. <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. Heck, Dragon Force. <laughs> Heck them. Heck yeah. them. Um, no, uh, they are. This song is awesome. It's just like, here, you want fast paced guitars? Enjoy! Yeah, especially since it's uh, after a phase transition. The first phase is like, you get the drama, and the second phase is like, okay, now things are getting intense. Get pumped. Second phase, you get the guest guitars from Japan who just shred. Yup. I'm going to be honest, I actually find mechanically the second phase easier. I know that's weird, but... Same. No, no, I agree. Okay. Like, of course, that's a bit build-dependent, but uh, overall, I, if I'm going to the second phase, I'm generally winning that fight. Yeah. Um, not the, I mean, it is a faster-paced fight. For better or worse, it is... The, the boss moves faster. Yes. Um, and that's reflected in the music, because, oh man... I feel... Did we use the first phase in another episode? I feel like this isn't the first uh, time we no, talked about what this. what we did is that uh, I put up in, I believe, Unexpected Metal, uh, which was a sub-team of one of the episodes. Uh, I put another version of that song uh, with a different intro. Ah! Which is why I'm not saying much, because I believe I already covered uh, some parts of that song. Which led to Eddie Eddie to his vocal plate. Which led back to this conversation now. So it all comes first circle, much like a roguelite. It's just a different path to get here. You just got meta. There is no escape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um... Incidentally, while we're still on, on this track, I just want to point out that there's a bit in the track that uh, I don't know exactly why, but the rhythm guitars remind me a lot of uh, the E1M1 theme from the original Doom. I don't know why. Huh. There's, oh, you're always, when I'm listening to this in the wild, let's say, I'm at the gym or whatever, and I'm listening to this, I I can't not pay attention to the rhythm guitars when that, come, when that bit comes up. Uh, I don't know if it was deliberate or not. I kind of doubt it, but that that's the impression I get. I don't know if I'm the only one with that. I mean, you that are fighting here. demons in hell, sort of. So it wouldn't surprise me if Darren Corb was at least somewhat inspired by, you know, other games that do that. I mean, technically, in this situation, you, uh, for this music, you're doing neither, but... Uh... I mean, true. That is accurate. No, wait, there's the summons, never mind. Yep, oh, right, yep. No, that's in phase one. There are no ads in phase two. No. Oh. One of them. That's why I find phase two easier, is because there's no ads. Yeah. Those ads can get spicy. Those ads can get Gray spicy. Ones. Oh boy, can they. So, moving from a song that is very energetic in one way to a song that is very energetic in a very different way. Oh, uh, come on, the transition is right there in the title. We go from one step from hell to one step from Eden. It's right there! Anyway, yeah, uh, one step from Eden with a never-ending song. We, I picked uh, this track uh, in particular, although I think the entire soundtrack is... Uh, very, very good, but this one has to be good. Because what's happening is that at the end of each of the stages in this game, you're fighting a different boss. Bosses uh, have a powered up version depending on 
how far along the progression they go, but uh, you always fight the same eight bosses uh, or seven bosses uh, in a shuffled order. And this one is uh, Violet, which is uh, a character that uh, plays a uh, violin and does some battle dance things, including something that could be uh, resembling a rhythm game f version. Ah. Basically, she charges one of the only attacks in the game that guarantees to hit every part of the grid because you're moving quickly along a 4x4 grid, trying to dodge attacks and place yourself in order to hit the enemy. Nice. And uh, what's happening in this fight is that uh, at certain times she uh, loads up an attack and you have uh, notes that appear on the grid and you have to chase them in order to accumulate a shield uh, by landing as the notes land uh, where they are. And so if you follow the Raven, you have the shield to fully tank the attack that guaranteed hits you. Ah. If not, well, you're soaking it with your health. And uh, it's not at set parts of the song. Wherever the attack starts, uh, basically, there's uh, a pattern that follows the song in its entirety, and uh, wherever it starts or stops is how the pattern goes. So, which is some pretty nice gameplay integration. For those who haven't heard this particular song, uh, I'm going to be honest. I uh, I thought this was written by the Falcom team at first because I'm like, this sounds like it's right out of Trails in the Sky. Yeah, and I can definitely see uh, the proximity in terms of tone of something that's very... It, it feels aerial. It, it... I mean, you say that, but you spend the vast majority of Trails of the Sky on the ground. It just sounds like the song Silver Will. Um, like, it's got the same kind of vibe to it. It's got the synth violin at the very, fr uh, very front and center. It's got, like... The fun, kind of bouncy, but still like tense beat. It, it's it's got a lot going on here. I I I I'm like, Silver Will is now stuck in my head. It's just playing on a loop now. <laughs> um, which is fine. Like I I don't think I talk about Trails in the Sky enough. I think that's I, I think that's a series that flies under a lot of people's radar, um, including this podcast. So I should probably find an excuse to bust some out because it's a the. the I only played the first two chapters of Trails of the Sky, and I have yet to play any of Tales of Cold Steel. But, um, man, so far so good on those soundtracks. The first two chapters were very, very, very good. Well, that's one and a half game more than me. But, uh, it's, it's a commitment to play this series, is what I'll say. Also, one of the, f one of the thing I just, uh, thought of, given, uh, what was mentioned earlier about the start and stop is that this song patently does not do that. No, it does not. And it's right there in the title. And it has to not do that because of the mechanics I mentioned. Yep. If there are stops in the song, you can't play the rhythm minigame and get the shield. So it has to get going every single time. And I think that's a nice way to have the... Uh, music and the game match together so well and get integrated so well. I love myself some interesting features uh, music uh, has as part of games, as I think we've established by now, and that definitely qualifies in several ways. Oh yeah. Honestly, no, I... Even if it didn't, didn't have that uh, integration with the, the gameplay, I just gotta say, Knowing that this game is heavily inspired by the Mega Man Battle Network franchise, correct. If only that that franchise had a soundtrack this good, because <laughs> uh, listener, longtime listeners might remember we did a a Mega Man special last year, and we basically stopped at the X franchise and went, well, um, the GBA and DS games exist. Yeah, they are a thing. If, if only they had this level soundtrack, like, Battle Network isn't horrible in its soundtrack, it's okay, except for the Crisis theme that plays in the entirety of the post-game, but if it had 
songs like this as the battle themes, it would be so much better. Of course, that was on a GBA, but the composition didn't help either, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, electronic and little else. I mean, I feel like we've established that composition can do wonderful things despite instrumentation. I've spoken very positively about Dark Savior's soundtrack, despite being on real jank Sega Saturn hardware and not really sounding all that good, like, mechanically. But composition is strong enough to overcome that. Um, so just because something's on the GBA does not mean it's going to have a failure of a soundtrack unless the composer is just phoning it in, and it sounds like for Battle Network they might have. Uh, Battle Network, just to go off top for a short moment, I... It's one of those franchises where I don't remember a single track, but to the composer's credit, whenever I hear something online, I can recognize the Battle Network style. I can recognize where it's from. Yeah, but I, but I think remember that's it. I think that's kind of the same situation we had with Pegling. You can only write, this is an action battle that's happening inside a computer so many times. Yeah. And the game had, what, six different entries? Six or seven, yeah. Not counting spin-offs and whatever. But yeah, that's a lot. Anyway, one step from Eden. Good soundtrack, never-ending song, good song within a good soundtrack. Now then, let's move on to... Basically an entire game soundtrack. Yeah, oh, an entire Bef game mode Galen's, soundtrack. Yeah, before so, Galen, who picked this song, says anything, I just want to point out. Okay. If anyone listening to this episode uh, decides to listen to our pick on the playlist before coming to this episode, you are correct. This sounds like something I would bring in. No, I wasn't the one. No, no, I was. You know why? Because it's Arknights. Wait a minute. We talk about this game all the time, or at least I do. Um, this is a mobile tower defense game that I play a lot. This game has a roguelike mode, uh, called Integrated Strategies. Now, the first one was called Siobis Fungamist, and I did actually talk about the soundtrack to Siobis Fungamist, Siobis Fungamist, um, way back in the day. Which was very different. It was very different. Uh, C.O.B. got high on mushrooms, and we got to see glimpses of her past. And her running across all sorts of wacky characters, some we knew, some we didn't. Um, As one does when eating magic mushrooms. Right. Uh, so in that one, in that case, that music was very jazzy. It was very, like, swing-oriented. It was very, like, weird and funky. And it was, it was not, like, it was not its own thing. Um, now, I probably would not have actually added Integrated Strategies 2 to the list today. If not for the fact that Monster Siren Records released a standalone album just for this mode. Yeah, and it's certainly a cohesive whole. It is. Like, the, the closest thing I can think of as a point of comparison uh, is actually from Hollow Knight. With oh. the Grimm's Troop DLC, and it's very much a similar atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hear that, actually, quite clearly, now that you say that. Um, so, this particular Intergame Strategies uh, is about Phantom. And Phantom is... Well, I mean, he's a giant ripoff of Eric from Phantom of the Opera. Shocking, I know. Um, <laughs> with a name like that. Uh, he is this kind of somber catboy assassin. So they really kind of play into the secrets of his history in this mode, and everything's very, very gothic, very, very, like, violin-heavy, very kind of, like, mysterious, very Eddie. I, like, I did say this was definitely an Eddie song. Eddie said this was definitely an Eddie song, or Eddie soundtrack. Um, Very, uh, welcome to our sinister carnival. Yeah. yeah there's, like, one jazzy song, uh, song for the shop theme, apparently. And Which? the rest is just gothic. Yeah. And that, yep. That makes I, sense. I was just listening, I was, I was listening, listening to this, uh, and I was just, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm home. I'm home here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I figured you would be. Like, yeah, I know your style well enough to know how that plays by now. Um, and, uh, 
No, musically, this is very cool. Again, because it's its own mode, but not only that, it's its own, like, change up from the first time this happened and has a completely different soundtrack. Like, there doesn't seem to be any recurring tracks here. IS-2 is a completely different soundtrack from IS-1. And that's what brings us back to our through line, where even within the same game with very similar mechanics by Uh virtue of it being the same game, we have two completely different soundtracks because they they are conveying the atmosphere of the game the world lighting is happening in more than any strict... uh, single point mechanic uh, element. Yeah, exactly. And I think it works really well. But then again, I've always been very complimentary of Arknight soundtrack, so that's not new information, really. How dare you be complimentary of soundtrack that is good? Right? Well, I mean, it's just one of those things that most people just kind of don't expect out of a mobile game, is to have a soundtrack not just this good, but this robust. Like, can you imagine... Uh, Rana, you and I both used to play Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. Can you imagine them doing something like this? Releasing a uh, roguelike s- mode with its entirely own soundtrack with absolutely no crossover with the mainline tracks? I mean, no, that'd be way too much effort for them. Right, exactly. That'd be way too much effort for the vast majority of mobile games. Yeah. But not Arknights. They are, they are, when it comes to their music, they're willing to go above and beyond, including a whole soundtrack just for this one mode. And IS-3 I... is coming in, in Hong Kong. IS-3 is on its way. We already know who it's going to star. It's going to star Mizuki, mm. who's this jellyfish dude. Um, and uh, I'm sure that's going to have a completely different soundtrack, too. I could see Genshin doing a mode that's surprisingly fun, but only lasts for two weeks, then disappears forever, and has no particular piece of soundtrack for itself whatsoever. Right. Right. They just go the extra mile with Arc Knights. They do. And that's something that I continuously respect. And this soundtrack is part of it. Like, I'm not sure the actual individual songs are all that special. I do like the shop theme a lot. I do like the final battle theme a lot. Though that one's yes, very Castlevania. That, those two are my big standouts as well. Yeah. Those are the two standout tracks. Like, yeah. Um... But the fact is that this mobile game went that extra mile and did an entire soundtrack. And not only that, but released a frickin' album of it. Like, a standalone album for just the game mode. Man, that says a lot. Man, that says a lot. Um, IS IS 1 was an event. IS 2 is permanent, or at least Integrated Strategies in general is now permanent content. I'm not sure IS 2 is permanent. Um, They may swap it out for IS 3, but... Like, the actual mode is now permanent, and it just, again, like usual, goes to show the amount of effort the music of this game, and just in general, the creativity of this game. I keep saying how much I love Arknights, and it's a lot of stuff like this. It's Uh, nice to play a game uh, and find reasons to enjoy it still. Right? Um, And it's like, this was kind of like a, a little look behind the curtain. This is, like, right now in my real life... Arknights, as it currently is, is starting to get a little stale. Like, I've been playing it for two and a half years. It's getting a little old. And now we're going to have the roguelike mode, IS-2, actually added for us in global fairly soon. Like, probably the beginning of next month. And I'm super looking forward to that, because it's a totally... It's it's the roguelike mode. It's completely different. Oh, yeah. Um. So, and it's... And, and, and then six months from now, we're getting... uh. This, like, card game mode that they're adding in, totally on top of the regular gameplay. Like, they just released a new event as well, just that does this regular sure, gameplay thing. Sure, why not? Why not? Let's just keep throwing modes with unique soundtracks and unique stuff at it. Like, this, yeah, this game is... Yeah, in a year, they're adding a third-person shooter somehow. Uh, they're already working on the spin-off, and it is going to be a third-person action. Or it looks like a Genshin <laughs> ripoff for now, but I'm sure they're going to do something unique, because that's what they do. It's okay, Genshin is doing Genshin ripoffs of themselves as well. <laughs> Oof. I mean, have you looked at Honkai Star Rail's interface? I haven't touched the game in like a year and a half. I've played for about a week, and reminder, I didn't manage to complete the the prologue, because the prologue has three parts. So I have no idea what's been going on lately. 
I'll just take your word for it. No, I was talking about a different game that has a, a very similar set of elements. Oh boy. Love it. But that's beyond the purview of this episode, so... And think right about integrated strategies. I on. will say one thing. The last track sounds very Castlevania to my ears. The, yes. final, ba the final boss track. It sounds very Castlevania-inspired. And on the subject of Castlevania-inspired, how the heck did we go into a roguelite episode and not one of us brings up Vampire Survivors? What happened there? Because I was going to bring it up in uh, No Playing to Cheat. Ah, never mind then. Carry on. You underestimated me, Mr. Firestone. I did. I, I, under I underestimated all of us, admittedly, because I'm blaming myself for this too. It's not like I don't play the game, but yes. Hey, I, I played the update already. It's good stuff. Yeah, no, you actually went ahead and you're on the beta. I'm not, so there we go. We're getting off track here. Let's talk about other video games and soundtracks now. Hi. Uh, what is... Let's get back on the train. The, the monster, monster train. train. Yeah, I saw that coming. Nice, I, nice. I should have, I should have seen that coming. No. <sighs> I actually picked this one, and I should have seen that. You should have. Um. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, uh, th this is a bit of a strange game. It's like Slay the Spire, but with more, uh, more in-depth combat. I'd say it has more elements to it. And uh, the setting is all kinds of weird. It's like they pretend to know stuff about angels and demons, but they really don't seem to. Anyway, uh, the soundtrack is pretty good. Uh, I particularly enjoy the boss themes, which this, uh, the one in the playlist, is one of them uh, for Arco's Dark Darkness Incarnate. Yeah, and by the way, every uh, bus uh, has their own theme, and you have multiple choices of buses at the end of each chapter, I believe. Yeah, there. Are, I think that's like there's like two or three per uh, area that you get one at random, something like that. Yeah, and so it's a don't... nice climactic moment because those buses are fierce. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I I lose. Uh, runs all the time to just any boss, pretty much. Yeah, it's... some bosses are just hostile to certain builds. Ah, <laughs> uh, do you at least and... have a pick of? You said you had a pick of bosses. Like you could, if if you can, you at least see them on the field and go like, this yes. boss is probably not yeah. what I want to fight with this build. Okay, you yeah, can? Cool. you know what boss you go going to fight the moment you uh, spawn. Yeah, you Got don't it. get to choose what you get oh, to see okay. beforehand so you, you can adapt your your deck if you get uh, good uh, opportunities like, and like even without scrolling the first thing the uh, game informs you of when you start a run is what version of the final boss what aspect of the final boss is uh, going to happen so yeah. that helps you prepare Unless you're a moron like me who doesn't know anything about uh, deck building, because I suck at deck building. The final boss gets me every time. But at least he gets you with some nice track. Oh, yeah, some the, the... train track. Oh, I didn't that catch hurts. that one. I, 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 that yeah. hurt. Yep. Mm. No, no, Oof. but seriously, what I like about this theme is that uh, on top of the whole uh, uh, darkness and uh, mystical aspect uh, of the bus fight encounter, you still have the very industrial sounds of the train that form the bass line. Yeah, um, so I was listening to this song and my notes are as follows. Uh, disjointed intro, great main verse. I'm inclined to stand by that one. I, uh... Yeah, like, it gets this, like, kind of, like, wild, like... Not very... Not very cohesive intro, but that leads into the main verse. I'm reminded a little bit of some of Yoshitaka Hirota's work, at least vibe-wise. Yeah, like, it's got that, uh, chaotic feeling to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
it's not that uncommon uh, for other themes in the game as well because it kind of zooms into your train at first and the song is already playing so it gets that intro when you're not in a playable state and then it gets to the main melody usually by then you're already uh choosing your cards and where to play things so it's sort of a, a an idea that the this menacing angel is coming down at you and you're just watching and then the melody kicks in usually that's how it goes in the game right I will say, though, it's interesting that a game that's similar to uh, Into the Bridge we started with has a, a game style that should encourage you to take your time and consider your option, has uh, this kind of track that is uh, so uh, fast-paced. So I'm not saying you lost a few of your runs because of the music. I mean, but if you were to blame them, it would have some grounding in reality. I mean, there have been times in many games where I have jammed out to the music so hard that I have forgotten what I was playing. So, you know, <laughs> this is a thing that occurs. Yes. Um, I think it also plays a lot on the on how fast you can lose units in this game. Uh, Into the Breach... The combat is much more uh, slow paced uh, compared to uh, Monster Train. Yeah. Because Monster yeah, Train, like... once you once you give your sorry biker dude, because mm -hmm. in Monster Train, once you give your orders, like everything gets done in a fraction of a second. Especially if you speed up uh, your game, which most people do. Otherwise, it takes ages to resolve combat, <laughs> and so. You're constantly losing things much faster than you're used to if you play other games, like yeah, Slay the Spire. Especially if you uh, use uh, some of the leading demons uh, that uh, have deck that favor using expendable units, like imps. Yep, or the uh, Melting Remnant's whole shtick of res resurrecting small units. Exactly. So it... Uh, your decision-making process is more or less on the same vein as uh, Into the Breach, but the way it plays out after you've made your decisions is much more frenetic. I think the music plays off really well off that aspect. Yeah, and it only serves to prove the point that more than the pace of uh, the game, the atmosphere of the game is what takes precedence when it comes to making a memorable roguelite soundtrack. Yeah. Step right up. Probably Which is the what the monsters do as they get through the floor of the monster train. Okay. That's the okay. best I've got on a short notice, sorry. Sure. Okay. Dicey dungeons, yo. Let's let's talk yeah. about that. Ooh. We'll go with Dicey that. Dungeons. So, uh, any of you two played this game before? I have not. I've, I think I've seen, like, a little bit of gameplay. I think another French friend of mine was playing it, and I was watching that. I've seen some YouTubers play it, but I haven't touched the game yet myself. Okay, so, uh, then, to further my question, do you know the game's aesthetic, then? My brain is kind, kind of, of defaulting. Setting to, like, Cuphead-esque, which I know isn't quite accurate, but also not inaccurate either. Ah, interesting. I mean, it's not too dissimilar from the art on the, the soundtrack album, uh, cover, is it? Mm, I wouldn't have like, it's made less, the... less detail, relation. but... Um, but... Uh, I ask these questions because of how evocative the music uh, is, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the very unique atmosphere of the game, which, uh, more than uh, relating to DICE themselves, is presented as a game show. Oh, okay. it's an, yeah, it's an in-universe kind of TV-like game show where you're going through the dungeon in order to get your wish. And at the end, you get to spin the wheel, except uh, you are facing the embodiment of luck. And even though 
there is just a tiny, tiny part of the wheel that is uh, you lose anyway. You always land on it after the final boss. Ah. Oh. And the uh, the lady luck in question is extremely antagonistic. It's great. And so the game is very playful, as you might assume. Yep. Uh, thanks to the music. Uh, music by Chipsol, uh, who uh, has listed on her Wikipedia page instruments Game Boy, which is already a pretty nice flex. Yeah, I I could actually hear that. You you, you posted this meme about the bleeps and bloops, but I knew exactly what yes. you were talking about once I listened to the song. I'm like, oh. That's actually talking about a specific part. Um, They're very good, bleeps and bloops. They are. They're a little dissonant, but that's not a bad thing. Like, it, it, it's clearly yeah, exactly. intentional. It's, yeah, like, that uh, game uh, and the game show within it is uh, kind of chaotic as well. It's, yeah. It's a riot. Yeah, like, they're they're not played the f- to the key signature. And by the way... But that's fine. And by the way, I am... Um, saying that literally when it comes to the last part of the game where you are recruiting the occupants of the dungeon you fought throughout the game and actually riot against the uh, luck itself nice huh the game has deeper lore than i than i expected it's a fun finale i i've got to be honest whenever a roguelike actually has good lore that's what it sucks me in like hades this sounds pretty yeah. cool. Obviously, Integrated Strategies had a lot going on with the story there, but some would argue Arknight yeah. is overwritten at times. Like, that's a great way to get me interested, is hunting down the bits of lore over the point of, uh, over the point of the, uh, gameplay experience of the repetitive loops. Like, yeah, especially since that lore, where it's fair, is also very lighthearted. Yeah. It, uh, know what it wants to be. That's why. Even though you're facing uh, the same enemies throughout the dungeons every now and then, uh, occasionally when you defeat them, you get to exchange a few words. It brings them character. Yeah. Um, this is something that and Peglin, th- for one, notably lacks. I have no idea what's yes. going on or why we're adventuring, but we are. Let's go. I wanted to make the unflattering com- comparison, but stop myself. Well, I went ahead and did so anyway, because I'm playing that game, so I'm thinking about it a lot. I should play yeah, a different exactly. one, you know, assuming this internet would let me download anything. Dicey Dungeons right there, and it's brimming with character. Yep, Dicey Dungeons is on that list. Be. Just judging by the soundtrack, both Monster Train and uh, Into the Breach sound pretty cool. Like, I'm, I'm, like, vibing on a lot of this stuff, so I might check it out. They're good games. It seems that way. I've been... Hades kind of... I, I would say Hades kind of awakened something in me, but mm, yeah, no, I that's don't fair. think that's true, because one of my first experiences of this is when I was a kid, playing the secret uh, roguelike island mode in Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals. Oh, yeah. The, I um, saw speedruns of that one, yeah. Yeah, like, there's its own mode that you, you could actually just do the island roguelike and pick your party, which is something you're not allowed to do in the regular game, etc. So... That was, like, way ahead of its time, because that was, like, legit Super Nintendo. That was, like, a year after FF6, maybe two. <laughs> and we were already doing the roguelike mode on Super Nintendo with familiar characters, etc. So it's like, alright, I like this. Yeah. Roguelites are a very diverse genre, and... They really are. In a way, more than that, more than genre, I think they're as pace for a lot of interesting designs uh, to emerge almost board games like. Yeah. I yeah. think we're getting to a point where uh, roguelites are so different from one another that calling a game a roguelite is basically the same as saying is it has RPG elements. Yeah. Like, I mean, you level up, it has RPG elements. Congratulations. Let's let's take a look at the, the list of games we're dealing with and what kind of genres they actually are. Arknights, Tower Defense, Dicey Dungeons, I guess technically turn-based RPG question mark, Hades, uh, isometric action game, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, we have some tactical, we have some bagel. Yep. We even have an FPS in the middle of all of this. Exactly. So... It's... 
And uh, as a result, even if they're going to get under the same umbrella anyway, they might as well use uh, the setting, the atmosphere, the personality, and indeed the soundtrack to uh, demark themselves. Even within the uh, same composer, Chipsel also composed for uh, other rogue lights, such as, uh, uh, I believe, one of the alternate soundtrack from uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer, and some of the tracks from the uh, Zelda spin-off of Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is also a very good uh, set of soundtracks, by the way. Yeah, yes, can can absolutely confirm that. I kind of forgot that was a roguelite. I'm so used to the rhythm part. Yeah, but that's that also counts. Yep, one hundred percent. These elements can be fun, obviously. Anyway, I think that's a pretty good set of points. Uh, so shall we move on to uh, something we've uh, all three of us listened to pretty recently? Uh, yes, though technically you were the only one who started this process off. Both of us had to play catch-up, not that I'm arguing, because it was good. Uh, so hey, I was able to catch it live, but the ones have uh, for a reason. Uh, much like last episode, we are going to once again do a two-part now playing, and the first part is going to be a concert! Ooh. And with that, let's go ahead and start talking about our weirdo version of Music Arcade now playing. <laughs> The Primals, FF14's house band, question mark. Yeah. Hashtag déjà vu. Question mark more than ever uh, for two reasons. First, because of uh, the track they started with, which have guest artists that are piped in pre-recorded in the concert. Oh, I'm going to have words about that decision. Anyway, go on. Yep. And also because of the fact that uh, the lead singer and uh, the guitarist are also uh, working on another Final Fantasy now. Yep. Um, well, you say guitarist. We have, uh, you say guitarist yeah, in mean, quotes, but two. to be clear, the guitarist in question is in fact Masayoshi Soken, who is the actual lead composer for Final Fantasy XIV. And the singer. Yeah, sorry, I... Sorry, when I said guitarist, I meant the Mario free, Hoops 3-on-3 free free composer, yes. The, uh, lead singer, or at least one of them, because the singer actually rotated several times, Christopher Michael Koji Fox, the lead translator and localization director for Final Fantasy XIV, both of whom, Soken and Fox, will be working on Final Fantasy XVI, uh, and they have been confirmed to be doing so. And you could tell that from the trailer. Yeah, certainly. But it's nice to have confirmation. Sure. Uh, speaking of Koji Fox being the, the translator, I just want to point out, uh, after the electronic medley that they have about halfway into the concert, uh, there's an impromptu interview there, and mm -hmm. it shows why Koji Fox got that job as a translator. Because that dude translated... Fast. Yeah, he's... He, I mean, clearly he's extremely fluent in both languages. Enough to make jokes in both languages. Yeah, he, he had a, a little notepad held up, but that was clearly just a gag. A visual gag. Because he was translating entire paragraphs of responses in a I flash. I don't think it was... A, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think it was a gag. So, I, I come from a family full of lawyers. I know, I know. Obvious Jewish jokes here. I cover a family full of lawyers. And paralegals, they have like this like super fancy shorthand they do to write stuff down with. Um, that seems like a very that seems like a skill that would really translate, ha ha ha, into translation. Um so I'm not sure that was a visual gag. I think he was actually using that to kind of gather his thoughts. I know a lot of people who do so. Yeah, and I or their shows how, is... how quick he is. Yeah. Yeah, like, that is literally his job, yeah. so... Yeah. 
it shows how he got the job because oh the yeah dude is good at it oh he's he's extremely talented no question i i wish he was a little less of a putter but you know that's because i'm a weirdo <laughs> he does love his fun um that said i will I like, go ahead i like and... how you're complaining of I like how you're complaining about puns when you're hosting a podcast with Rana and myself. Oh, I made two. I don't want to even call them accidental, but I could not think of another word so far. That's why I've, like, pointed them out and been like, I don't want to make this pun, but I can't think of another word now. Um, we are proud of you. Th th thank you. Anyway, let's start from the top. We open with footfalls. Canned vocals. Canned vocals, yes. canned vocals, canned vocals. Oh, why would you do such a thing? I mean, I know why, but I still hate it. Yeah, I understand why, but... I think that... Um, like, there were multiple solutions, and they, I feel, took the easy one. Yeah, they took the easy and quite possibly the worst one. Like, I yes. would have minded it a lot less if one of them tried to sing some of these parts. Exactly. Or to do a reinterpretation. Yeah. They have done that they before. They did. Uh, they're some, good. Sometimes with more success than other times. Yeah, and that's fine. Um, yeah. But instead, they just used the canned vocals. And th this is a recurring problem throughout this thing. Um, yeah, like, especially for this track, since they have the screen in front of yeah. them, it feels exactly like uh, listening to the album version. And that's not what I listen a no. concert for. No, exactly. Like, there's room for that, I guess. Um, but, I don't know. I, I, I thought this one fell flat from a performance standpoint. Yes. It's entirely understandable why it's the intro, though. Yeah. Honestly, my, my main note that I made for this track was Poor Man's Linking Park, question mark? Oh, brutal. I, oh, brutal. I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy that one. I, I, I'm I okay with Linking, Linking Park. They're not usually in my wheelhouse. But I didn't like this song. Like, the, the instrumentation was pleasant enough, but with the vocals, I, I checked out. I... I, I, but no, the singer is part of another band named the Architects, which I don't know much of myself. But I don't think they do new metal. Yeah, there, there wasn't any rapping or anything. It was mostly like someone was trying to be Chester Bennington and failing and failing at it. Is is the vibe I got at least? Well, all they could very well succeed at it in a live environment, which wasn't the case in this situation. Yep. Fully agreed. Also possible. Um, after that, we had the one-two punch of Blinding Indigo and quote-unquote Big Fat Tacos, Ultima, the Primal's version. I would separate them mostly because uh, Blinding Indigo, we've soaking at the vocals. I think that's noteworthy. Okay, fair enough. Um... It was fine. Like, I like this performance. I didn't really feel like it was notably different from the performance of the last time we covered it. Yeah. I guess. It's a bit looping, but uh, it's a nice way to just set up an energy for what comes next. Yeah. I I do like the song. I like Blinding Indigo. I think it's a cool song. Yeah. I, I wish we had a Leviathan Mount that played Blinding Indigo. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, I just found uh, a bit awkward the the singing because uh, that th phoneme in Leviathan that's not present in Japanese. So you had uh, Soken in in lead vocals and the rest of the band in backing vocals, and it seemed like each of them was pronouncing that th phoneme in a different way because it's not present <laughs> in their language. So it what was you're very saying? Awkward to listen to that. So what you're saying is that you didn't have any Leviathan. Boo! I regret nothing! The pain is real. Uh, anyway, moving on to Ultima, the Primals. I still don't very yes. much like this song. I don't think it was particularly different performing it from the FanFesta version. Koji Fox was there, now lead singing. Not that you could tell, because that 
is intentionally very garbled. Yes. It's uh, not where he shines the most. I think it does the job, but not much beyond that. I quite like the song, but I agree that uh, it's a nice bit of energy and not much much else. Yeah, honestly, the most fun part or uh, for this for this song was just seeing Cody Fox uh, over emote everything as if he was in theater. Yeah, I will have more oh, comments yes. about him as we go, but um, yeah, I, I stand by that I didn't really think this one gave us a whole lot to work with here. Yeah, uh, Metal I'm more positive about. Though. I would say, yeah, Metal was cool to hear. This is the first time I heard them perform this particular version of the song. Yeah, um, even the visuals with the gears in the back were pretty nice. It was pretty nice. Uh, once again, Koji Fox is over-emoting. That said, I am starting to be convinced that he is just not a good singer. <laughs> well, good news for the next 12 songs. Right? Um. So, yeah, no, uh, I like this song in game. I like this one performed okay. Koji's okay, but like, I don't know. Eddie, what did you think of this one? Because this would be the first time you heard this one, I think. I like the energy. I didn't like n neither the leading vocals and neither the backing vocals. The instrumentation and the energy were amazing, but I could have done with a better singer. Yep. Um, I'm more positive on this one. I just really like uh, metal and it goes well with uh, that uh, heavily processed parts in some parts and then going into something very shouty. Yeah. <sighs> um okay so. and then like i said uh they basically had the lead singer for two songs and then until uh i'm actually going to count this time the next one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve songs are without the lead singer because why so like, would, would he sing them? Yeah, like half the concerts were with a different kind of song, which when uh, you uh, said at times this felt like a goodbye to for different reason, that's what I had in mind. But basically they have two playlists uh, telescoped uh, as part of that concert set. As if getting ready for the possibility that they might need to do some performances without Koji Fox and have enough of a playlist to do that. Well, I will say that later on he does say, and I quote, the next time we meet. So it's pretty clear that he is intending to stick with the band and is intending to yes. continue performing with them. So my thought process yes. on that one was just totally wrong. Uh, the, the way this set list looked uh, made me think it was a for, uh, farewell show for them. Like, this was going to be the last Primals concert. But he just made it clear that wasn't the case, like, just openly. So I don't know what the heck. Like, I'm, I'm going to have some real comments about the actual set list later. We will talk about that. It's funny. I get to rag on a song that I already ragged on for completely different reasons. Um... Oblivion, then. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oblivion. I actually like this version. It's amazing how much better this song is with an actual guitar mix. <laughs> like, my... my yeah, note for this one was yeah, the version, not my style. The version in-game is very noisy. Oh, my God. I hate that guitar tone so much in-game. But this time, they actually had, like, an actual guitar tone, and it actually blended well. Um, one thing I meant to say during... Uh, one thing I meant to say during Footfalls that we didn't get around to, and I'll say it here. I found that the actual, like, live mix was very guitar-heavy, and that the drums were, like, really just toned back and scaled back. So you'd think Oblivion yeah, would be, like... Yeah, which is a shame, because... Which is a shame, because the drummer gave it his all. Oh, I yeah, the drummer he, was doing great he tonight. He might be the MVP. The drummer was... The drummer or the bassist were the two, like, like big shots tonight, I think. But, um... Yeah. In this case, it's like, wow, I actually like the song Oblivion. Like, just flat out. Yes, there's some weirdo singing it. That doesn't matter. The vocals were never my problem with Oblivion. It was always a guitar tone. Turns out when the guitar tone isn't balls out insane, the song's actually good. Yeah. 
Imagine my- I don't even want to say shock, because I kind of knew this was the case, and yet I could- I- I- oh, man. Yes, Shiva's Theme actually is a good song when the guitar mix is actually, like, properly set up. So I guess this is just a giant, uh, a giant, uh, spotlight shown on my career. Learn how to mix. Bad mixes will ruin songs. Anything to add, Eddie? No, I just- uh I, I just noted down that this song is not my style at all, and that was it. Understandable. It wasn't bad, um, it's just not my thing. So, this yeah, was... Yeah, it's very... Uh, Oblivion is uh, inherently very uh, uh, favorite song of uh, a girl going through uh, her 15s and having emotions. Um, Now... This was sung by Gun, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct, right? The, yes. the guy who totally screwed up Equilibrium last time? Yes. He sounds a lot better this time. Yeah. He sounds a lot better. I, I didn't have many complaints about him. He's still, like, very... He walked his butt off. Like, his pronunciation is distinctly Japanese. Oh, yeah. And uh, it does go into some weird places every now and then, but... Yeah. Overall, it's way cleaner than the last concert we had. He was him. a lot more on key. I don't have that many complaints. Like, he's still an amateur or singer, but this is clearly, like... These are very talented musicians, but they're not a very talented band. Does that make sense? Like, they're not a very yeah. super professional yeah. band, but as instrumentation, they're just excellent. Um, yeah, like, it shows that they have uh, jobs on the side. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I've heard worse from yeah. in-house bands by game studios. Yeah, same. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, what in general wakes me, then, uh, with a duet for, with uh, Gun and Soken, and I just like the rhythm of this song. I, it feels like we're carried along and pass from one another, and given that they both match this time, I think it's nice. I have exactly two notes for this song. First, my opinion on this song remains the same as, as last year's. Second, the falalas still make me think of Christmas. I fully agree. I'm not a fan of this song or this mix of this song, but they performed it well. I think that uh, the mix makes it a completely different song, which I respect, even though that's not my favorite instance of it, and my favorite instance of it wasn't on the set list. They definitely are doing something different with the song. I will certainly concede that point. Yes. Any anyway, bring back uh, Ravenna's theme. You cowards. Oh, that would be wild to hear. Uh, okay, and then moving on to the thing Gun screwed up last time, which was Equilibrium. Um, much more on key. He, he... Yes. He still made a couple of mistakes, but that was much more forgivable. It wasn't like every note. Like, last time yes. I was counting the notes he got right. Um, yeah. This time... It even was... for... Even for overall, I think that song's rendition live is fine. It's fine. It's, it's not my favorite. I still would have preferred a female guest vocalist. I think that song just works better with a female lead. But I appreciate what they're doing, and I appreciate what they were able to make... They appreciate they were able to make it work. I still don't know how that last one went ahead. Certainly somebody in rehearsals went, this guy sounds just absolutely awful and we need to skip this one. And no one did that. And that still baffles me. These guys are supposed yeah. to be professionals. Like, that was bad before. But but full respect on the fact that he must have grinded in oh, order yeah. to get to this place. The, the improvement between now and then was very, very noticeable. No question. And then we have uh, uh, this uh, interesting scene where they mark a pose. It's not even the first one in the concert. And then they have some electronica played by somebody in the costume of an ancient with his hood down. Right. So my exact words here, here. I'm going to just read my notes. This is a cute and weird segment. I love it. The dude has big hands. Probably Naoki Yoshida. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> nope, it's... Yeah, except... Except I knew it wasn't him because we saw him and they, I think, made a point to show him a little bit before in the audience. You see, I missed that. Oh. I want to walk through uh, what I was doing 
because I had this in the background as I was working, just like last time, because uh -huh. I work from home as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And so my notes go basically in the order of my my experience with this with this medley. I went, okay, I have zero idea what the imagery, uh, imagery means at all, but this sounds pleasant enough. Um, then a few minutes go by, I realized the melee hasn't ended yet. I expected, I didn't expect it to go that long. So I ta I'll tap back and I go, what the hell? Is that uh, yeah, Matsu? because you, you missed uh, the reveal. Uh -huh. Because at the end of the first part of the melee, which I think is uh, FF5. Yes. Uh, yes, so it's an FF5 tracks, and they use it in-game, so it's not completely off the left field, but like uh, Galen yeah, was, I, I... said uh, while we were discussing it, and I'm glad I didn't sell what was happening next, uh, it's the Primal's console generally stay in their wheelhouse right. rather than going into the uh, tracks from previous games that, that they use in 14. Right. So that was a bit unexpected. And so after that track, he lifts up his hood and it's Uematsu. Yeah, I was blown away by this one. Um, I'm going to be honest. I kind of mentally keep uh, FF14 in a separate space from the uh, rest of the mainline FF games. Yes. Uematsu has always seemed very ancillary. Like he would do like one or two songs per X-Pack for the th first three like contents like ARR he had a few songs in there heaven's word I think he just had one um and then Stormbloody had one that no one even remembers exists because they basically never play it during a boss fight and he's always been kind of like outside of FF14 it's always been Soken's baby in terms of the music it's always been this own entity so I was I will I will quote you, in fact, uh, for what I said during the concert as I was reporting it. Uh, as the third track came through, which was a uh, uh, battle of, on the big bridge with some Kefka-like sounds somehow. And uh, I just said, oh yeah, give me some big bridge. And you reacted with, not often they go off of FF14. Usually it's their gig, not to Ematsu's. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> with my best poker face. I, I was looking at that in retrospect and just going, Rana must have held back so much. He must have. <laughs> I got to see Nobuo Matsu perform Big Bridge in my lifetime. Yeah. I got to see Nobuo Matsu perform Big Bridge in my lifetime. What the hell? And it's some interesting uh, re renditions. Yeah. No, they were very interesting. Um, he's clearly like slowing down, like I could tell from the performance. There was a lot of back, a lot of backing track. He was using a lot of automated arpeggiators. Um, yeah, and he was clearly like he was precise with the tone bar, but or tone wheel. But you could see when he was using the tone wheel on camera that he was like very slow and deliberate. So clearly there was some like computer nonsense going on with him but it was still an incredibly strong performance from a guy you would don't usually associate with ff14 playing some og classic final fantasy tracks and you don't usually associate with live performances no no I was about um, to say. oh man uh and apparently like i did actually stop and watch this bit of stage pattern i actually skipped most of the stage pattern on the playback i watched this bit because mm -hmm. it's Uematsu. He has an yeah. album coming out. I want. Yeah, it's it's an album promo, and it's a damn enticing promo. I mean, yes. Yes, just flat out yes. My, like, the only way they could have made this section better, because boy did it land right how it needed to. Yes. The only way they could have made it better, I think, is if uh, the big bridge part was a duo with the rest of the with the primals because there is which a... i think would have worked very well i think but it would because have... it's an album promo i understand why it did, didn't I, happen. honestly the other thing is this is uamatsu and this is like how often do you see this guy perform i don't blame them at all for just letting him have the stage he is the daddy yeah. of he is the father of final fantasy music let's let him do his thing I, yeah, exactly. I I think a duet performance they even, would have been cool. They even joked, they even joked uh, during the 
between the the performance and the interview that came after, they were joking that he was the legend and the ancient. Like yeah, yeah, everyone. Yeah, that's knows. that was literally his costume. Yeah. But yeah, they, they were joking. That he he was the real deal. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. We know. Yeah, yeah. You're you're not wrong. Exactly. Um. So I find myself in a position where it's like, that is awesome. I am, I am, I am so happy I got a chance to see this. I was not expecting this yeah. at a Primal's concert. Um, exactly. I have actually seen Uematsu perform once before. He did show up at one of the Distant Worlds shows. I think it was actually the, not the FF7 remake show, but the FF7 special show where they announced FF7 remake's release date. Which then, of course, got yeah, pushed back. Fine. He was there, and he actually got into the chorus for One Winged Angel. Like, he actually, like, set up there. But this is the first time I've oh, seen him sweet. perform. Yeah, but, I mean, he was just one voice amongst, like, 40 people in that chorus. Whereas this time, we got Don't to care, see... still sweet. Yes, I agree. Fully agreed. This time, we got <laughs> to see him actually perform Final Fantasy stuff, and I'm like... Yeah. Oh, this is amazing. I am so happy this exists. I am going to buy this album the second it happens. Assuming, I mean, even if it is on a Blu-ray, I don't care. Screw it. Um, yeah, and I'm sure on a level he's glad to uh, do something beyond uh, FF7 uh, and uh, flex his FF3 and 5 muscles. Yeah! I mean, that's part of the reason this album exists. They, they said that during the interview, that basically he wondered how he would orchestrate uh, some of those songs uh, today. And uh, Square Enix was like, yeah, sure, we like money. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. They they know old school fans like that are going to buy it, and I'm certainly going to be one of the people who buy it, so yes. Good, yeah, good, good even go. if it's on a weird format. Correct. Um, That's because you are insatiable for those kind of things. You know, I don't even have the heart to be angry about the joke because I'm too angry at the songs <laughs> themselves. Canned vocals. Yes. I love Also, I, I noted uh, as an alternate title, Insatiable, but you have low DPS, so this takes a while. <laughs> because they go on like a couple of loops in order they to do. fit in the video content, which is a pretty cute idea to have... Uh, players send videos of themselves playing the game as part of an illustration. Yeah, but like you, you had a comment that I actually thought was what they were doing as well when they said this. They said, yes. we we sent in, uh, we asked you to send in videos of you playing along with it. And I'm like, oh, so we're going to have guitarists actually like playing along with the song. No, it was just gameplay footage. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought the same. I, Good, uh, glad it's not just me. No. At, I, at the end of the day, that that was uh, realizing that wasn't the case. Sort of, kind of made me go. Ah. This and whole, I, was, they, I was expecting something more interesting. And like to be perfectly clear, if they went with such a call, they would have way too many guitars to know what to do with them. No, I oh, mean, yeah. uh, I could imagine though just being performed like not not you. We don't hear them, but we just see yes. the footage in the background. I feel like I feel like there would be enough. Like there's enough musicians in the fandom to make that happen. Yeah, because, like, right now, there's a project about, uh, I think, uh, Food Falls, where uh, Alex Mukela asks for uh, people interpreting some uh, parts, and uh, the final selection with someone who has way less reach than Square Enix themselves uh, landed with, like, a little bit under 600 performances to mix together. Yeah, I, I, I feel Which like... Which is why it's taking months. Yeah, no, I feel like this absolutely could have... Absolutely could have worked uh, if they'd done it that way. But instead they just did the gameplay stuff. It was cute, but, like, this whole trio of songs, Insatiable 2, The Edge, Shadowbringers, like, they're good songs, but the last time we had them, we at least had Jason Charles Miller beamed in from somewhere. Exactly. This time it's just canned vocals. I have absolutely yeah. no enthusiasm for any of these tracks, as much as I do enjoy them. And, and what makes the matter even worse is that due to COVID restrictions at the concert, uh, they can clap and wave their sticks all they want, but they cannot cheer loudly or sing along uh, and give a true back and forth with the concert. Yeah. 
and in with Shadowbringers in particular that just made the song as a whole suffer. Yeah, I I agree fully. Um, I really do like the these songs. Quality. I felt these performances were subpar just because of the restrictions and because no live vocals. In fact, I even put in another channel that I if uh, if the fan fest ever comes back to the states, they had better get him on stage. Yes. You wanted to say, Eddie? I, I just mostly agree with uh, what you guys are saying. Just, I enjoyed this track, these uh, tracks a lot. I guess I didn't have such a negative uh, reaction to them uh, because I'm not as familiar with the originals as you guys are. It's not uh, even the originals. Yeah. It's that we had, uh, like, the concert version of To The Edge is literally what made Galen like the song. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also a, a big shame uh, that they had this weird policy that the, the crowd couldn't sing along or anything. Because that's, like, part of what makes concerts, metal concerts, great to right? listen to. Exactly. Like, uh, just to push, uh, pull an example from way, way outside this, the purview of this episode, but uh, Iron Maiden's uh, Fear of the Dark. Oh yeah. That song is iconic mostly because of its Rock and Rio performance where the crowd is singing along to the riff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's like, wake the metal, metal. And if you can't say the metal, the song loses something. Yep. Um. Yeah, no, I was I was deeply frustrated by this trio. Uh, however, what comes next is actually really cool. What comes next is amazing. One of my that along with the FF five and just the Uematsu stuff is actually my favorite part of this yeah, whole. Yeah, like yeah. they're the weirdest part of the concert, and they work so well. Like in in my list of songs, I assumed would come. This was the last one I imagined they'd do. We we. Like, they, they set up an acoustic set. They still had one of them, I think it was Gun, still on electric guitar. Um, uh, no, I think it... Yes, yes, correct, yes. Gun was on the electric guitar, and the bassist was on the acoustic guitar. Right. Um, and they just got the band up close. They had the drummer on, like, bongos or something. The one time we could yeah. hear the drums, like... You know, the one time we could hear the drums, like, cleanly. Uh, exactly. And they played this acoustic set of the Charlie and Day theme that I just thought was amazing. It was great. I was so happy oh, with this. I, noticed, so I noted down the exact words that I noted down was a ballad that I don't instantly hate. What sorcery is this? <laughs> right? Because I don't usually like ballads by metal bands. I was expecting some sort of hair metal crap, like, I don't know, Journey or whatever, when they huddled down and we're like let's grab our acoustic guitars from the side and oh no no and then the song came up okay I, okay I, I dig this I did well, dig this I think the Good big job. difference yeah, no, is it's... that Sokin is just such a prolific composer like we are hearing the metal tracks but they only paint one picture of what is truly a gigantic soundtrack comprising a exactly. buttload of genres so he does a lot of like non-metal stuff a lot of non-metal stuff in the uh in the game and so we're hearing some of that expertise come forward whereas most metal bands just play metal yes and when they try to go off basis we end up with when they try to go off basis we end up things like mathematique by till lindemann which is one of the worst songs i've ever heard in my life but the you will bring us happy. is good i was happy forgetting that thing exists welcome Thanks. to my pain eddie you're the one who brought this topic up <laughs> uh, then we have Closing the Distance. I actually kind of like this song. It, it was a... I kind of love this version. Very echoey like that. Yeah. I mean, it was canned vocals but... again. Great. Yeah. But um, it plays very well live. I definitely liked it better than the in-game version. The in-game version just annoys yes. me. It isn't a to-the-edge thing where I think I'm going to love the song now. I did end up hearing the song again after the concert in-game, and I'm like, this still gets a no for me. But the concert version was actually pretty cool. I like this a lot. Yeah, like, for this song, the canned vocals, while not as good as a live performance, don't hurt the song too much because of the distance of the fact that it's meant to be 
not so much emerging from a point, but going from everywhere, if that kind of makes sense. Uh... Which, like, if you compare to the context of what's happening in-game, the fact that you can kind of hear the voices of your friends, even though they aren't there anymore, is kind of the point. You're a little more forgiving than I am, I think. Um, I am. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I will never, like, forgive the canned vocals. Um, I like this in spite of them. Yes. I don't think they work yes, better. Like, like I said, I don't think they work better as well. All I'm saying is that this is the song that's hurt the least. I, I will, I will agree with that at least. Good. I will agree with that at least. Um, no, I I definitely have a better opinion of this than I did of the in-game version. Uh, then we have flow, and the thing that disturbed me the most about the song mm -hmm. wasn't part of the song itself. Not a single picture or moment with Vanna in the visuals throughout the entire song. Even though, it's kind of her song. I mean, my notes comprised of two words, all capitals, CANNED VOCALS, and I pretty much checked out <laughs> after that. I'm surprised. Yeah. Also that. And I think the... A uh, live version could be so good, like... This is the song that would be improved the most. I... I mean, yes. This is definitely the one I was the most angry had canned vocals, despite, again, loving the trio of Insatiable to the Edge of Shadowbreakers under normal circumstances. Those just did not work with canned vocals. In Flo's case, the canned vocals made me angry. Yeah. Then, moving on, we have the return of Koji Fox with the song that was clearly put in the game in order for the Primals to have a new song sung by Koji Fox. Um, I believe my exact words here were, nope, even live, this song can still get bent. I Well, I like it. I'm glad someone does. I really am. I'm... I think it will gain some more point when the crowd will actually be able to shout pandemonium. I hope so. Eddie, what did you think of this one? Because I've been, like, raging about this song basically since it came out in game. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, I thought it was okay. I mean, it, it was cool enough for me to listen without, without feeling, like, angry or whatever. Or annoyed. But... Uh, it wasn't the best. I would say it's... I Overall, I prefer the songs uh, in the second half of the concert that we're talking about. Uh, I see the concert as being basically cur uh, cut in half by Wilmot's uh, performance. Uh, this was probably one of the weakest ones of the second half. Fair? To yes, I will say that, yes. Like, I say it's obvious what its purpose was uh, because it kind of I mean the context in game doesn't fully justify a song with vocals I feel. I fully agree there then again like the pan uh, again from the FF14 episode uh, from the Endwalker episode uh, I just raging in, in anger and howling in pain at, at Pandemonium Raid and its music choices it... I am not that hard on it, but yep. it's not something that will uh, get uh, sealed into my mind, even though uh, during even the slower version of uh, uh, the song, which doesn't have vocals, I'm still saying uh, Pandemonium as... Uh, as I should, because it's just a nice thing to repeat, you know? It would, it would be fun It would be fun to do that live. I would agree there. If I get to cheer along with that yes. live, I might enjoy that process at the very least. Yeah, like, it's almost on the level of saying Rise Up during Rise. Right? Yeah. Um, but first we have A Long Fall. This song's still cute. I like this song. It's, yes. it's, it's better than the song it's remixing by a wide margin. My two main remarks are that 
they added the mandeville to the choreography. Okay. That's not really that reference the... any we'll get, I'm sure, but yes. <laughs> and that the biggest faux pas is that Uematsu wasn't one of the dancers. <laughs> he, I mean, okay, first... I mean, it's the same outfit. It is, but all of the dancers were girls. I think he would stand out. Yes, he would. Oh, Your point. God. Okay. All right. You want to do that to the old man? You go right ahead. I, I, I will live without having tormented him by making him a backup dancer in this mess. <laughs> I, I will admit, I kind of, I, I, I appreciate the professional dancers, but I also kind of miss the uh, just jankiness of the first time around seeing this one with the like staff members as the backup dancers. Yes. I, I I kind of thought that the amateur dancing was very cute, and this was almost a little too professional. Um, professional Mandeville. Yes. Uh, then we have When Worlds Collide. Yep, no, I, that's flat out what I called it on my notes. When Worlds Collide remix. I was. This is easily my least favorite song in this entire set list, because I'm like... You know what? If you're gonna rip off one brother, maybe rip off the other one. Get us a Rob Zombie-like track in here. We need more of that in the world. God, I I hate this. I I love this song because I was less exposed to Polo 5000 uh, than you. And uh, also that's kind of the latest release that happened when I started playing the game and actually reaching Endgame. So I suppose the song sealed itself into me more than it would in somebody that started later. Nostalgia is a powerful force. And yes, I Indeed. I listened to Power Man 5000 throughout the 90s and early 2000s a lot. I I see what you're doing there. What am I doing there? What? Uh, using uh, nostalgia in order to uh, underline your own point, which is a clever thing to do. Ah, fair enough. So, um... Yes, I will agree that in a vacuum, this is a good song. It's one of the reasons why When Worlds Collide was one of the biggest pop metal acts of, like, one of the biggest pop metal songs of the late 90s. Um, when I, the one time I saw them live was at the Summer Sanitarium Tour 1999, which was Metallica, Korn, Kid Rock, Power Man 5000, and System of a Down. Power Man closed with this song because it's, you know, it's their big hit. Um, it's very good. It's a very good song. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to just read back our comments on uh, on my Discord because I think it's relevant. Ah, yes, Fiend. The song I like better when it was called When Worlds Collide. And it's like, I know they say it's accidental. Sure. Uh, Rana, <laughs> you go ahead and say your line because I love this. Right. Hey, that's fair. Last time I tripped and accidentally shouted as I felt the entirety of myself. Purpose. Right? It just happens. Yeah, I, I exactly. I refuse to believe that a bunch of rockheads like this didn't didn't like. I I believe it wasn't intentional. Like they're not intentionally ripping it off. But the inspiration from When Worlds Collide is very clear, and that is that was a song that was very hard to avoid for any rock and metal fan over the last twenty years. Like it's it's pretty entrenched in the consciousness there. Yeah, I mean, it's R Rana has it's a the point, essence. Last time I felt. Last time I fell, I started shouting the entirety of Rammstein's uh, Zer Stöhen, and I don't even speak German. Yeah, there you go, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the essence of, uh, hey, can I check your homework? Sure, uh, just um, change it a little to make sure right. it's not too obvious. So while this song is good in a vacuum, but I totally agree with that point, and while it was pretty cool live... I can't get over the yeah. fact that it is also probably the biggest ripoff on the soundtrack. Yeah, it certainly is. I, I, I just, I can't... I wish I could. Then, then, as the concert approaches to a close, they uh, lay down the obvious ones that still weren't there yet. Starting with uh, Under the Weight, now with Fire. I'm okay with Fire, even though that is an Earth Elemental yeah. boss. Um, yeah, exactly. Th this is their signature song. This is the one they seem to like uh, playing the most. I was kind of expecting this one to close the show, but it didn't. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, it's a classic song. Um, I, I will say, it is a classic song, but I would like to see how they do Landslide at some point. They're willing to play Blinding Indigo. They should be willing to play Landslide at some point. And it's not like they have a problem playing remixes and the originals at the same set, right? That they don't. 
And uh, also I'm glad that uh, given that this isn't a fan fest open to everyone but a concert, uh, they actually use the version where they actually say fuck you Titan. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, they actually dropped the F-bomb. Not that I think that improves or doesn't improve the song in any real way, but it's cool that this is technically uncensored. It's a nice memory of the many uh, landslide at 300 uh, millisecond forced pings uh, we had to eat. Okay, yeah, fair, fair, fair. Um, Titan is my least favorite primal to fight extreme, so I, I fully agree. Although, you know, I've been pretty complimentary about E4S as a boss. Yeah, it's a good boss. Titan Maximum was fun. Although I haven't done the Savage version. Savage is very fun. Uh, once you get past the opening segment, which is, like, the normal mode but hard, um, once you get into its phase two, it gets really interesting. Yeah, and, like, even recently with the 24 Mine Raid, we know that when they are having fun with arena shapes these days, it's generally some pretty good stuff. Yup. Um, I would like to hear them try Landslide out at some point. Uh, but yeah, this is a classic song, it's here for a reason, they played it well. Eddie, your thoughts? Uh, I thought it was okay. I, not one of the tracks I had too much to, uh, write about. Just wasn't big on Koji Fox's vocals here. I'm not big on That's his vocals big, in general, but he does, he does, he does this one okay, I think. It's a shorty track, he shouts a lot. Yeah. Uh, then we have Escape as the uh, closer. Since we're talking about Koji Fox, I just want to point out that my my notes for this track are it is hard as balls to take Koji Fox seriously when he's emoting as much as he's to the point he's almost dense. He over emoted a lot on this track. Hey, guess <laughs> what, guys? It's everyone's favorite time of the show. It's when Galen rants about Escape again. I'm going to rant for completely different reasons because I actually like this performance. The drummer was kicking ass. He was having his best performance of the night. Yeah. Um, like we said, MVP. Yeah, yeah. Like, as as a performance goes, I actually enjoyed the song. It sounded nice. But... But my complaint about Soja Fox was just I could not laugh at his emotions. But Fair enough. The actual song was, was fine. Who go on with made your the set list? Why is this here? You just played a long fall two songs ago. They even brought back the backup dancers. They even brought back the backup dancers. It's like you're trying to make us think of the other song. Like, okay, here's my big, big takeaway of the night. They should have swapped the position of this song or a long fall, pick one, and Big Fat Tacos. Now, to uh, give you the troll answer, but they already did that with uh, Flow Under Your Bremuth. It's the same song too. And they're two songs apart. Yes, and I was annoyed at that one as well for similar reasons. But those at least sound different enough and are different enough genres. That they do. That yes. I'm a little more forgiving of it. Plus I was already angry at Flow for unrelated reasons. So I didn't actually catch being angry about this one. But yes, it's the same problem. Um... You just played the other version of this song. You played the remix two songs ago. Now you're playing the uh, now you're playing the bassist song. You didn't even give the remix chance to breathe, and you're just making us think of a long fall, which you just played by bringing back the backup dancers too. This was a mistake. I don't know who did yeah, the set I, list, but I'm legitimately I, like, what the hell about this one? I fully agree that. Uh... Swapping Ultima and Escape would have been the better option. Or or a long fall. A long fall would have been a pretty great intro to Koji, right? That's yeah, a exactly. crowd pleaser. That's fun. I mean, it was so good it was memed into a different status. Right. Um And I would have been a lot more forgiving of Escape under those circumstances. Um, like to uh, give you an idea, Eddie, of uh, what also makes uh, uh, a long fall kind of special, most of those tracks are big climactic uh, encounter fights. Uh, a long fall is 
just a remix of an existing song and is uh, the main track for an optional dungeon. Yep. And okay. pe and everybody was like, you have to play this dungeon in particular. Right? No, it's a really cool song. I will fully admit that. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I hate the fact that Escape was played so close to a long fall. It's this, like, you just played the remix. You just played it. Stop. Again, the whole, like, flow thing, I was already pissed for different reasons, so between that, but the You Are Brimeth is also, like, a very different take on the track. It sounds different enough that I almost don't mind. But yeah. under, but, uh, not under the way, sorry. A Long Fall and Escape are both mid-tempo rock songs with the same melody line, same chorus. What are y'all doing? And uh, I think... While it is a shorty song, which means it's in Koji's wheelhouse, I don't think the live version brings up that much compared to uh, the in-game version. No, I... Like, it improves it, sure, but not that much. It doesn't fully reinterpret anything. Yeah, it's it's fine. Again, the, the, the highlight of that song was the drummer just absolutely putting on the show of the night. He was great. Yes. That that drummer was absolutely rocking the whole night, 100%. Now then, uh... Oh yeah, another place they could have put a variation of a song they played at another point would be in the Encore, which they did with Metal. That's not a problem. No, because... One version of Metal in the main set list, the other in the Encore. It works very well. That actually worked perfectly. I was totally for that. Um, I, in fact, I was using that as a counterpoint. Like, Metal was track four, and uh, yeah. this one is, like, the first song of the encore, so there was enough time for metal to breathe, and then we get into the remix with the trumpets and the horns and the funness. Like, no, that actually works really well in terms of splitting those up when they did. Like, I'm actually, that's good. Yeah. That's good stuff. And I understand that apparently they wanted the encore to be an Alexander special. Yep. We wouldn't have minded adding some Omega in the Alexander. That would have worked. They're both big robots, and they seem to be linking that yeah, with exactly. music with that one uh, vocal pad they like using, so... Yeah. But yeah, Metal Brute Justice version, it's just a, such a fun song. It's a fun song. Um, I will make one comment. Uh, the last time around, uh, they did the version of Alexander that was actually from the Epic of Alexander, from the Ultimate. Um, yes. So they did uh, Locus then Brute Justice, then Rise. Yes. Um, they mixed up the order this time. I'm not sure this works, but I'm also not sure it doesn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I Like, it's weird compared to the game, but at the same time, I understand that they would like to close with Locus, but at the same same time, I think Rise is a better closer. I think Rise is a better closer as well. it depends on... It depends on the energy they want to send people home with, kinda. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Race is probably my favorite song. Uh, like, one of my favorite songs in the game, and my favorite song to play live. I, I, for sure. I think out of Alexander, I like Locust better, but there's nothing in Alexander that's bad. So, like, yeah, exactly. they're all that just soundtrack is just great. Um. And they played four out of five of the tracks of it. The only one they were missing was Exponential Entropy. Um, yes. But yeah, no, Rise... Also, sh shoutouts to the public for playing along amazingly well with the tank stuff. Oh yeah, that was great. Uh, Rise is just a good song. I like hearing that one live a lot. This is the second time I've heard it live. Yeah, it's been and, good both and times. And by the way, Eddie, there is a mechanic as part of the fight where the bus stops time, which is why there's a break in the song where nobody moves. I see. Okay. If you're playing the Honestly, free trial, I, I, you will get there. Yes, it's part of it. Okay. That that's spoilers for the next segment, but uh, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But uh, honestly, I, I'll just read my notes for the encore in general. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Brute justice. I like the trumpet. I very much don't like the vocal. <laughs> Rise. I like the intro and the guitars. I very much don't like the vocal. Locus. Uh, less than ideal vocal seem to be the glue that keeps the encore together. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, the bird. I, 
I am actually going to actively disagree with this one because I think one of the songs where Koji's vocals work the best is Locus. I actually enjoyed Stoken more than Koji in that song. And I don't usually enjoy Stoken singing style. Mm -hmm. I wasn't yeah, I mean, focused on the entire encore. Personally. I mean, you are a Koji hater. That's what we've discovered. It's fine. Honestly, I, I started the concert actually liking the dude, but over time, I, I just realized that the songs I enjoyed the least were the ones where he was singing. Yeah, that makes you a Koji hater. That's fine. There are laws to protect people like you. It's called We're Okay Having Differing Opinions. Um, yes. I think Locus is good in spite of the vocals. I, I, I'm i I'm going to take the middle ground here. I, I got pretty sick of Koji's vocals throughout this concert. He's just not a professional singer, and that much is very evident. But he gave it his all. It was fine. I don't think he detracted from the song. And Locus is just fun. Okay, then. I don't have much more to say. I, I like the instrumentation on, on all three. It's just the vocals I couldn't get into. Fair enough. Uh, and that covers the concert. It was good. Uh, hopefully next time they play, yeah. they will have, uh, some actual singers with them. And I, I don't mean that as a dig on um, Koji. I'm just still pissed about the, I, I'm still yes, pissed about the, the canned vocals. vocals. That was a big standard point, uh, but uh, I'm glad that, uh, it was not the only thing we had to say about the concert, thankfully, because of, uh, the guest and because of, uh, the little... Uh, acoustic bongo session. Yeah, that was. Those were the two like highlights for me. Was the two weird they parts, were. but I think that's that's a good sign. Yeah, I'm glad they're still trying weird things and sticking the landing for those. Very same. Um, and that a, now a brings... band gets boring when they stop experimenting, and it's good that they still are experimenting. Yes. Uh, and while we are talking about bad vocals, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into actual now playing now, if that's cool. Let's now play. So I've been playing the FF6 Pixel Remaster. Oh, yes, you wanted Here to we go, go off of that. Oh, yep. you, you, warned us, you warned us in advance. Oh, yeah, so the rage it. is happening. They complete... I, I'm going to have to bleep myself here. They completely f***ed the opera. Have your soapbox, sir. They completely f***ed the opera uh okay so uh the opera they messed up in two different ways uh way number one they didn't let us select the language um it's it's just whatever language you're playing the game in this is kind of an annoyance oh. for me because it's like yes i i'm an english speaker but i've heard this opera in a number of different languages and i think it sounds the best in italian i fully agree and i would have liked to have listened to it in italian the second problem, and this is like, I don't know who did this. Um, it's, it is vocalized. It is actually performed. It is performed by a mezzo-soprano. Celeste doesn't strike me as a mezzo-soprano. No, no. This is a big operatic soprano solo. You want your big head voice. You don't want to sound like a pop singer. Yeah. This sounded awful. The singer was completely miscast in English. Like, oh my god. And it's not like yeah. there's a shortage of sopranos out there. It's not hard to find one in the theater scene. Yeah, I mean, I just refilled my water bottle uh, before. I almost tripped on a soprano on the way. Ha 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 ha. Look, I, I, I actually work in this industry. I know how hard they are to find. The answer is not that much. Like... Yes. Of course. Anyone studying opera music or classical music is going to know at least one soprano, because that's what happens in music schools. You get split up into your sopranos, your mezzo-sopranos, your altos, your tenors, etc. It, 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 ooh. Yeah, like, a little indie company square and it's kind of hard to uh, cast a proper singer. And? Especially to a uh, kind of legendary song that has been established for like 30 years yeah um to the point where last time i was at distant worlds they had a soprano or last time i heard this at distant world excuse me they had a soprano yeah. what i heard this on youtube just about every performance of this is by a soprano why why did they hire a mezzo for this what in god's name compelled them 
to hire a mezzo for this. They completely thrashed the song. Yeah, that's weird. I'm... I'm just furious about this. It sounds terrible. The singer sounds bad. They're not... They're using yeah. a throat voice, not a head voice. It's... Ooh, I... Mmm... This is one of the most powerful and poignant music scenes in Final Fantasy history, if not the most. This so far had been batting a thousand with their remixes. I actually really like the Pixel Remaster soundtrack. Yeah, like that's a very good soundtrack of a it really I was is. impressed. Like the battle music is amazing. Yeah. I heard uh, uh, because you have access to the song menu and you have access to pretty much Every song except the opera. Uh huh. And uh, even the uh, later on the uh, dancing mad. Uh, it's not perfect, but there are definitely some moments that are very enjoyable. I haven't heard that yet. I'm still kind of going through the game. Um. Yes. I I mean I love the remix of Devil's Lab. That makes me very happy inside. I just finished that dungeon. It sounded yeah, great. It, it's great. But the opera is the one they screw up, and badly. Like, very badly. I, uh... I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know why that... Like, they went out of their way on the opera. Like, they actually made the game isometric for a moment. They gave us different camera angles or something that didn't happen to the original. Like, clearly, yeah. they meant for the opera to mean something in context. And the English language and vocals, then, which they wouldn't let me change off of English without a 3 gig mod that I had to get off of Nexus mods. Ah! Um, ugh. Yeah. How is it this the thing they mess up? Okay, that... No, then. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's enough well, ranting out of me. eating some furniture, I will take it if you don't mind. By all means. Uh, on uh, what I'm currently playing, well... Uh, first, like I've said, I've uh, been playing some Vampire Survivors, yep. which had an update going better recently, which means I'm glad that there's finally uh, in the game uh, a version of uh, a music that formerly was only in a secret situation, and that is the new stages music. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a very good music, so I'm glad it's more readily available, and uh, there's also a new character music for a new character, because, and I just realized that the five characters you unlock, uh, well, no, five characters you unlock for coffins are the characters with uh, personal music. Yep. Uh, so this one is no exception, and it's less sketchy than a Concetta or a Pugnala, but it's solid. Nice. And the uh, other thing I started, like, I stopped to get ready for this episode recording, but I started the Fire Emblem uh, Free Hopes, the warrior version of Fire Emblem Free Houses, uh, that has a demo that's out, and I'm glad that the song I wanted was right there in the first prologue stage. I wanted to see what they do with uh, Foodland Winds, and I'm happy to report they did good stuff. Like, they took a good song, added some warrior sauce, mostly guitars, and uh, I think that the rest of the soundtrack can go in some pretty interesting places because the game, uh, Free Houses originally, also goes in interesting places. Like, it's a game that goes. Uh, medieval music, uh, heroic inspiring stuff, heroic inspiring stuff, peaceful stuff, heroic inspiring stuff, suddenly dubstep, and an opera. The hell? Suddenly dubstep, yes. huh? Yes. Suddenly dubstep. What are we playing, Arclights? I think... <laughs> I mean, I can see the proximity there, and uh, yeah, I think if they afford themselves to have fun with that, it's gonna be great. Okay. Okay. I'm, uh, looking forward to this game with, like, a bunch of asterisks after it. Um, yes. The Switch is I'm not a great piece of hardware. I'm still in the cautious optimism phase. 
Yes. The Switch is not a great piece of hardware, purchase. so I'm the, oh. the frames are going to chunk, and I know this. So will I have the patience to deal with this? I don't know. Let's find out. Will How many times will you be able to withstand enemies disappearing and reappearing in front of you? Not many. I, I, we've moved past that in Warrior's Land. <laughs> like, that's not really yeah, a thing that happens anymore in everywhere that isn't the Switch. Yes. Including Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, somehow Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition works just fine. I'm not even talking about Definitive Edition. It still happened on the 3DS version, but that's a 3DS, so, like, I get it. I'm not talking about the 3DS version either. Ser I'm talking about the original. Seriously, the Wii U just worked? Yeah. What is happening over at Kawaii or over at Nintendo? Pick one, because the last couple of Warriors games on the Switch have not really worked that well. Yes. At least the music is good. Yeah. Now then, any uh, game country playing on your end, Eddie? Well, I haven't been on the podcast for um, a while, a month. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just do the the Cliff Notes version because there's quite a bit since I am still sub to the Game Pass. Please do. go for it. Uh. RoboQuest, we talked about it. Sounds amazing. I love that game. Very fast-paced. Uh, Spirit Hunters, it's basically vampire survivors, but with a more involved progression and a worse soundtrack. I've been playing that because I am not on the beta branch, and I got bored after the, after the last main patch for vampire survivors. Uh, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, uh, it's John Williams, of course, that's great. Yep. Yeah, I tried playing Watch Dogs Legion. Uh, it seems like that game doesn't play very well with the AMD drivers. I am partially regretting having chosen an a Radeon GPU, but I'll try again see if that works. Uh, it suffers from basically GTA syndrome, where the main soundtrack is okay at best, but the true gems are in the music you listen when you're in the car. Uh, and I've played approximately half an hour of Final Fantasy XIV last night after it download, uh, finished downloading, which took hours upon hours because apparently the launcher hates me. Mm -hmm. I I even downloaded a fan-made quick launcher, which is supposed to make it go real fast. Uh, it didn't it just fix the crashes that I was having with the download process, so. Yeah, at least it's progress. Download. At least I got to install the thing. Um, but yeah, I, I only play like 30 minutes, so I've only heard, what, a couple songs and a few jingles. So far, I'm, I'm in that phase where the soundtrack is just alright, because I am not doing anything big yet. Yeah, I... especially since as a Lancer, you should start in Gridania, and I think uh it's my least favorite of the three original main series i would agree with that song wise it's kind of boring yeah <clears throat> it's nice and peaceful but it's no da and it's on no limbs no limbs i love the limbs song well i uh, my house is I my player house the is Limsa, song. So. Mm. i definitely like Limsa. <laughs> i might check that out afterwards but yeah you'll be that... able to troll there on level 15. Yeah. So we're here. Um, but yeah, that's that's the Cliff Notes version. I've actually played a couple more games beyond those, but those have been the the main ones right now. The ones with interesting soundtracks, other than Spirit Hunters. Oh, well, Spirit, Spirit Hunters. And uh, as a little bit of five minutes uh, soon playing. Yes. Uh, I given that we are. Uh, in the time period where uh, announcements are going to happen, uh, like PlayStation announcements already happened, and uh, there's some uh, future soundtracks to uh, keep an eye to, so I wrote a little short notes of uh, just things that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, like the Monster Hunter Rise uh, Sunbreak extension is pretty soon, and uh, Rise was the best OST in the series, 
I'm looking forward to some more outside of the uh, Japan like setting. Awesome. Where they can stretch their legs some. Uh, of course, in a couple of months, I believe Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is going out, and I expect nothing short of excellence. Um, I assume Ace Plus is still on the soundtrack, but do we know who some of the other guest composers are? Is it still going to be Mitsuda, or is it going to be Shimomura again, or I somebody else? I hope so. I I don't have any name. Uh, they actually, when Xenoblade 2 started making the rounds, they, they made it clear that the music was by Ace Plus again, with Mitsuda and others, so... I was hoping they'd do yes. something similar this time, but I guess they didn't. Maybe they did, I just haven't looked uh, into it. Fair enough. Well, that's that's information worth tracking down. Yes. Uh, what I do know is uh, FF16, and here again, I expect nothing short of excellence. Sokin is pretty consistently good, though, you know, anytime he tries writing in English, it's pretty cheesy, and that trailer did show that off. Certainly. But I always like that there are some inserting uh, uh, vocabulary used. Like, one of the first things that really made my ears perk up in one of the songs is, again, during the Ravana theme where Heidelin is mentioned. Yep. And like, oh, that's some inserting song. That song couldn't exist out of the game. Which is why the trailer song listing the summons, uh, all the icons... Uh, it's pretty nice. Yep. Bayonetta 3 looks like it could have some pretty nice stuff. Platinum usually has some uh, good music, and Bayonetta's very consistently good. Yeah, I wonder what they'll pick for the main song motif. Uh, Neon White, I played the demo at uh, like three months ago, and uh, I'm really looking forward to more Neon White because that was very good. Right on. Splatoon 3 uh, looks like uh, they have their own genre, they do their own yep. thing, and their own thing is really nice. Sure. Uh, in kind of the same area, uh, but more indie, uh, Bomb Rush Cyberpunk, they, it's basically that they will have to have a good soundtrack. The game will not succeed without that. Alright. Uh, then... Uh, we had the trailer for Street Fighter 6. I'm and, uh, so looking forward to this game. <laughs> I certainly appreciate a lot that they are going Street Fighter with this one. I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about the uh, open world. Like, open world Street Fighter is not something I thought I wanted, especially since, like... Zelda and Dynasty Warriors, whatever, whatever companies like this go open world, the results are very mixed. But I don't know, something yes. about this and the fact that I know it's on the Resident Evil engine, I don't know, something about it just makes me just like, I, I'm feeling like this could be cool. It's, it's given off a couple of Shenmue vibes, gonna be honest. Well, let's hope it won't go with the worst of Shenmue. I, I would agree there, but I, I don't, don't know. I don't see that happening. No, I... I... Let, let's hope they do best better with the open world than when uh, NetherRealm tried doing open, open world in one of the uh, PlayStation 2 Mortal Kombat games. PlayStation uh, 2 was the bad era of Mortal Kombat, so that doesn't really surprise me. But we seem to be in a very strong era of Street Fighter, so... Also, the original couple of Shenmue... Actually, on the Vitra Fighter engine. Ah. So the comparison is legitimate. Yeah. Well, it also uh, is like, could be a follow up to Final Fight, and I'm going to point this out because there were a lot of like weird Final Fight clues in there. Um, yeah, like the Mad Gear Gang. The Mad Gear Gang, specifically Damned showing up. I was so surprised to see that guy in full 3D, and I'm like, uh. but you also have like Adore in the background in one of the stages and stuff, and I'm just like, this could be the closest I get to a new real Final Fight game. Also, I'm just going to say this. Final Fight, Street Fighter 2, we have the entire World Warriors cast in Street Fighter 6, apparently. Uh, yes. Both composed by Yoko Shimomura, for God's sake, Capcom, just bring her back. I've been begging you to do this bring for a while. Back. If there's ever a time to do it, it's now. Yes, that would be great. I still go back to hearing the Smash Brothers Vegas theme remixed by her. She remixed herself, oh, it's and so it's good. so good. It's so good. It completely reinvents the theme. It's so good. 
Um, uh, anyway, to close the uh, soon playing yes. uh, section, uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. There's always at least a couple of surprisingly good songs in Pokemon, which yeah. mean they shouldn't be surprising it anymore at this point. No, no the soundtracks are solid. Yeah, exactly. And uh, with the main motif and theme of the games, they could go interesting direction. I would, f for instance, uh, encourage uh, some soundtrack variations uh, depending on the, on the version you're playing. Uh, and yes, I did read that Co Wrong Fox, that Toby Fox, best known for Undertale at this point, to my incredible disappointment, um, is putting yes. a couple of uh, tracks on there himself, so he will be Sorry, part of the Sorry, I believe team. you... I believe you mean uh, uh, Hovestuck, occasional guest composer, Toby Radiation Fox? Yes! I, I would... <laughs> also did some tracks for Pokemon Legends Arceus, which I thought was wonderful. Yes. Indeed. Um, and f uh, as the final two games I have on my little list... Uh, in uh, also in the category of uh, games that really must have a good uh, soundtrack, a TMNT Shredder's Revenge. That had better. That had better. Yes, <clears throat> they have the Turtles in Time's shoes to feel. Good. Turtles in Time was a great soundtrack. Let, let's just be real yes. about that. That that was amazing. It was. And finally. Uh, I expect some weird of the beat uh, tracks from Dream Settler, which is the spiritual sequel to uh, Hypnospace Outlaw. Uh, I don't know either of those games. Dive. Well, they are uh, kind of a, a internet moderator slash light detective gamers in a weird alternate reality version of. Uh, GeoCities and AOL era web pages. Nice! Which means that you get uh, songs that play uh, whether you want it or not, and uh, in universe songs that are discussed and all that, and it's. it's a riot. I love it. If it's based on the early, early days of the internet, does it have a copy of MySpace that plays New Metal in the background? Not in uh, Hypnospace, because I think that was before MySpace took off. But Dream Settler looks like it's a little bit later, so there might be that. If they copy MySpace and the song playing in the background isn't new metal, they're doing it wrong. Fully agree. I live that age, I know how it was. Yep. Like, don't get me wrong, there is fake new metal. Okay, well, done. It's great. I will send you the link after we are recording uh, uh, the episode, which is drawing to its end. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Ready? that's all we have for today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Hey, it's a record. No internet crashes for over two hours and... Well, there he goes again. Uh, well, you can listen to the tracks we discussed in this episode on the playlist on our YouTube channel. And a reminder that, yes, you can get in 